Okay, I just don't want to be too much feedback. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Starting over. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, I do hope that this uh, that this series has been uh, has been beneficial to you. It's certainly been beneficial to me to kind of go back go back through some of these principles and ideas from God's Word as as pertaining to uh, dealing with our faith and applying it to our finances. Exceptionally important since uh, finances touch all areas of our lives. And so it's extremely important for us to, uh, to get our minds right uh, so that we then get our behavior right with regard to, um, of course, all of life and all of life is stewardship, but in particular, in this particular series, with regard to, uh, to our finances. Ultimately, um, our lives are about faith and faithfulness. And God's word is, is what gives us faith. We, we talked about it last week, how that uh, listening to God is what gives us or develops our faith. Uh, it's, the, it's the starting point for our faith, and it helps to build our faith, and it focuses our faith on the one uh, in whom we should have faith. And, and obviously that's God, and certainly not uh, our money. Money has its limits. And um, today we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be examining those limits to some degree as we, uh, as we look at our role as stewards as we are to uh, work, save, and invest. Let's start off with this, uh, with this little poem written by M.A. Stoddard. Work while you work, play while you play. This is the way to be happy each day. All that you do, do with your might. Things done by halves are never done right. And uh, the poem actually goes on, but that's from, from 1883. And uh, it's, it's filled with principles uh, that, ma that make perfect sense and give us some guidelines for how we should uh, conduct our lives. Um, Ms. Stoddard, with simplicity and elegance, uh, outlined the keys to a successful life of, of work, uh, recreation, and satisfaction. Uh, we should, when it's time to work, we should focus on our work, not be uh, idly letting the day slip by thinking about or daydreaming about playing. Then while we're playing, we should focus on our play. We should focus on our recreation. We should relax. We should take, let our minds take a break uh, rather than thinking about, oh, all of this work that I have to do. Uh, and so if we can accomplish that, we'll, we'll be better for it, certainly. Work is a four letter word that some people uh, think is a bad word, but it's not a bad word. It's not a bad word. In fact, Proverbs 14 verse four reads, uh, where no oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. I think the point there is that oxen are messy and troublesome at times. And sometimes we, if we were dealing with, uh, with an ox or a group of ox, uh, oxen, then we would find ourselves with headaches that we wouldn't have if we didn't have to deal with these oxen. Of course, that's from, from the Proverbs. And uh, dealing with a, a society or a culture that was agricultural in nature, uh, we, we have that uh, somewhat less so probably in this, uh, in this group, uh, but we can get the principle. Uh, the oxygen uh, or the oxen are equated to our jobs. So with our jobs, sometimes they give us headaches. Sometimes they're troublesome. Uh, but if, and if we didn't have a job, our lives might be less complicated. Uh, the, the trough might be clean, so to speak. Uh, but with the strength of an ox comes much increase. Uh, we can earn an income. We can build wealth. Uh, with a job, with work. So, uh, so work is not uh, is not a bad word. Uh, work is not a uh, an evil. Uh, work is something that is important and and God's plan for us. I think we'll see that here uh, in a moment. But this uh, this next this next little clip, if it works, this next clip uh, is a is a depiction of uh, some people's uh, perspective on their relationship between work. And God. I'm gonna see if this will work. Let's let's just see. I'm 
getting done. Oh, well, this is a bummer. Harvest? Oh. It wouldn't be here. Let's try again. Eaten it. Let's start over. Here we go. So. All right. We cleared this land. We plowed it, sowed it, and harvested it. We cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be eating it if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We work dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel, but we thank you just the same anyway, Lord, for this food we're about to eat. Amen. Okay, do you recognize do you recognize that clip? Miss Gay? Shenandoah? Uh, good movie. Uh, I, I enjoyed that movie. Something that you might want to consider taking a look at, but it's set in the 1860s. Um, it's a tale of Charlie Anderson and his family. Uh, as they find themselves on the in the inevitable march or the path toward the Civil War. Now, as you can tell from this uh, from this clip, Charlie Anderson and his family had a strong work ethic. Uh, he was strong on self reliance, but perhaps weak on Thanksgiving and recognizing uh, who the blessings really came from. And, and you might say he was in danger of the admonition that Moses gave uh, the people in Deuteronomy eight seventeen. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this well. Certainly work is a part of the program. It's, it's part of, of who we are. It's, it's what we do in some, in some ways. Um, Charlie Anderson and his family recognized the value of hard work. They, they saw the benefits that came from hard work. Uh, our culture today is increasingly teaching an altogether different mindset or way of life. I don't know, if hopefully you can see this on the screen. Uh, this is from a Chipotle bag. Hope that in the future all is well, everyone eats free, no one must work, and all just sit around feeling love for one another. Lofty goals, ideal utopia, uh, some people think so. Leisure, Recreation, entertainment, uh, to the absolute exclusion of labor, is the uh, is is seemingly the way of the world. But ultimately, that that utopian mindset, if, if for people who think of it as utopia, really is just the path toward uh, making government uh, all all beneficent, the the giver of all of all good things, uh, uh, beneficent and providential. Because if someone doesn't work, um, well, the Bible says neither should he eat, uh, but it makes perfect sense. If, if you're not uh, productive, uh, then it's going to be difficult to, uh, to earn a living. If you're not productive, it's, it's going to be difficult for a society to thrive. Uh, Gordon B. Hinckley once noted, the process of stretching our minds and utilizing the skills of our hands lifts us from the stagnation of mediocrity. He added, we simply cannot expect to refine the substance of character from husks of pleasure. And I think that makes perfect sense. Has anyone here experienced boot camp or, or anything uh, like it? Maybe, maybe a handful, a couple? Uh, would, you wanna go back? Would you trade the experience? Yeah, well, boot, boot camp was easy. Oh, boot camp is easy. I hear, I'm hearing. <laughs> what's what's the follow up? Oh, just, just boot camp is easy. That's it. I thought there was going to be a. Oh, this was a joke. <laughs> just what you make of it. Just what you make of it. That's right. That's right. Uh, I, I didn't. I never uh, experienced boot camp um, in the military, uh, but we we called my uh, my sales uh, training. We called that boot camp. Uh, we, and we called our, uh, our sales manager, our drill sergeant, and uh, you know, he, made it, uh, he made it fun and interesting, and not fun and interesting, I mean, uh, scary and difficult, uh, because you just thought for sure at any moment you were going to uh, lose, lose the, the job that you had just secured, and uh, as a result, you know, you're gonna have to, have to be looking for something else. So uh, he, was, he was very interesting, and um, you know, it, to use the boot camp analogy, I wouldn't want to go back, uh, but I certainly wouldn't trade it because uh, because there is it is a character developing process, no doubt about it. 
And I think uh, that it's time for Christians to understand and exemplify uh, the divine admonition to work and serve as productive members of society and not as wards of the state. Uh, I think we need to have the, the idea and the mindset of being makers and not takers. In a recent survey, uh, one quarter of uh, Gen Z said that they plan to earn their living by being social media influencers. Now, I, I don't know if you, you know what a social media influencer is, but, and, and, and perhaps there, there is something productive about that. Uh, but ultimately, you know, I was kind of, kind of turning this over in my mind. I was thinking about how that someone has to uh, build the Teslas that uh, these that the, the, the Gen Zs want to want to drive, and somebody's got to run the resorts, and somebody has to uh, teach the fitness classes, and watch the kids, and cook the food, and so you know, not everybody can be a uh, social media influencer. Somebody, somebody has to work. And we need to get our minds right about work. Let's, let's look at Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28. We won't necessarily turn to all of these. We've actually looked at some of these before. From Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28, we learn that uh, we are here uh, on purpose as God's vice regents. Uh, we are to continue this creation process. Uh, we are made in his image. God is a creator. As, as being made in his image, both male and female, uh, we are told to rule over, or to subdue, or to exercise dominion over the creation. And in doing that, we're, we're harnessing, we're combining, we're enhancing, we're causing more growth, uh, we're being productive. And so that means that as, uh, as humans, as, as vice regents of God, we are uh, cultivating fields, we're mining for metals, we're uh, producing, we're uh, extracting other commodities. Uh, we're domesticating animals to harness their strength. And ultimately, uh, this is not a curse. Work is not a curse. If you, if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 15, and chapter 2, verse 17, uh, God tells us, uh, God told Adam to tend the garden. Of course, that was, uh, you could say, it was physical labor. And then in chapter 2, verse 20, he says that uh, Adam is to uh, name all of the flora and fauna of the garden. And so you could say that's mental labor. Uh, blue collar labor, white collar labor, however you want to describe it. Uh, work was a, a divine admonition. And all of this took place when? Before or after the fall? Before, right. Because it's not until we get to Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, that we, uh, that we see that the effort that is put into labor uh, suddenly becomes more difficult and involves things like thorns and thistles and, and the sweat that we are more familiar with today. Thanks, Denzel. Appreciate that. Thanks, that. thanks for that reading. Work. Work is exceptionally important. So we, we have a foundational knowledge now that work is necessary. And it's not a punishment. And it's not evil. Uh, so we can acknowledge now that all work done ethically, uh, done honestly, and done to the best of our ability, is in no way, and in, and in no way causing someone to sin, uh, is spiritually proper. Uh, there's no such thing as secular versus spiritual work. If we're all doing uh, what we should be doing with our talents, uh, to the best of our abilities, uh, to be productive members of society. Generally speaking, work can provide us with, with some level of satisfaction. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 18 and 20,
teach us that the only beneficial and appropriate course of action for people is to apply themselves in some form of work and then be rewarded for their labor uh, with, with wages. Psalm 128 verse 2 says, when you eat the labor of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. Meanwhile, the other side of that is, of course, how that laziness is dangerous. Uh, perhaps so uh, we could look at Proverbs 6 verses 9 through 11. I think one of, one of my daughter's favorite, uh, favorite verses, how long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. And that's actually uh, repeated in Proverbs 24, verses 33 and 34. So uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's important. Perhaps it's important for us to recognize the danger of laziness. And, you know, maybe another verse. God is a, is a God of humor. And he, he inter- injects humor into, uh, into Scripture uh, in ways that help us understand things. From Proverbs 26, verses 12 through 16. Uh, do you see a man who is unteachable and wise in his own eyes and full of self-conceit? There is more hope for a fool than him. The lazy person who is self-indulgent and relies on lame excuses says, There is a lion in the road. A lion is in the open square, and if I go outside to work, I will be killed. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy person on his bed, never getting out of it. The lazy person buries his hand in the dish, losing opportunity after opportunity. It wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. The lazy person is wiser in his own eyes than seven sensible men who can give a discreet answer. Excuses. Uh, Thought of as reasons for not putting hand to plow and doing work. Uh, We need to have have the right attitude uh, as it pertains to uh, to work. Colossians 3 verses 22 through 25 teaches us to uh, to be sincere and diligent in our occupations, uh, to give our best effort, uh, to to put forth the effort that we would uh, that we would want to to see if we were watching someone else work, uh, working as though we're working in front of God and not um, not in front of a, a human a human boss. Maybe just jot these down so it was because of time we won't be able to go to these. But let's look at, uh, uh, maybe write down Proverbs 11.1, 1, uh, Proverbs 20.23, 20, uh, Micah 6, verse 11. And we will look at uh, Deuteronomy 25, verses 13 through 15. Because I think this is an important point as we consider uh, doing our best. We need to be honest laborers. We need to be honest in our, in our, in our work. Proverbs 25, verses 13 through 15. Uh, you must not have in your bag differing, differing, uh, different stone weights, a heavy and a light one. You must not have in your house different measuring containers, a large one and a small one. Uh, you must have an accurate and correct stone weight and an accurate and correct measuring container so that your life may be extended in, in the land your God is about to give you. For anyone who acts dishonestly in these ways, is abhorrent to the Lord your God. We must be honest in our dealings. We shouldn't um, we shouldn't shave off time. We shouldn't shave off uh, product. Uh, we shouldn't give less than what we're supposed to uh, in either our effort or in what we're supposed to deliver uh, to the people that we're working with and, of course, working for. Second, Second Thessalonians 3 verse 10 says, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. And then Ephesians 4.28 says, Let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. We have a purpose in our work. Obviously, uh, part of the purpose is to provide for ourselves and for our families. But it goes beyond that. As productive members of society, uh, as people who are called to be uh, Christians, uh, called to be Christ-like, uh, we need to have something available to help someone else uh, in need. And you know, Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. I take from that to, that to mean that we will always have an opportunity to help someone 
uh, who is less fortunate than we are. So maybe in summary, with regard to work, if your chosen vocation is approached with diligence, honor, integrity, honesty, and is productive and beneficial to others, then get busy working for a living, glorifying God, and teaching others by your efforts. But we don't just work. We also need to move forward. Uh, we also spend. And we need to have some guidelines with regard to our spending. And we'll just, we'll just work through these fairly quickly. Uh, the, first, the first idea is to spend responsibly. Uh, from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, which reads, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on, on earth, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We need to make sure that we recognize the limits that money has. Uh, and money and things, uh, our possessions, they can only give us so much. And so as we are working and as we are spending, we need to spend responsibly, not expecting too much from what we're buying. Ultimately, all of these things, and this is in uh, tucked away in that passage, all of these things that we are busy working for to buy, uh, they break, they wear down, they wear out. And what, what was uh, amazing yesterday is not going to be worth it tomorrow. And the, the must-have today, uh, in, a, in a week, a month, a year, is going to be tossed over in the corner. And we just need to recognize that. And so when, as we're working, as we're spending, we need, to, we need to think before we spend. So we need to spend responsibly. And then we need to spend conservatively. Uh, from Proverbs 21, verse 17, we read, He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Simply, simply stated, it's not always about the biggest and the best or the brightest. Sometimes it's just about what will suffice, what will what will do, what will make do uh, as we're spending. We need to we need to give that some consideration, and then we need to spend judiciously. Uh, Isaiah fifty five two. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what is not, what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let let your soul delight itself in abundance. The money and things will only give so much uh, pleasure, only so much satisfaction, and ultimately it's not lasting. We kind of refer back to uh, spending responsibly. Uh, we, we shouldn't expect too much from money and what it can buy. And then let's spend without covetousness, Luke 12, 15. He said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Ultimately, things are not the ingredients that make up uh, a lasting, satisfied life, a life of fulfillment. Jesus says your life doesn't consist of those things. It's, it, those aren't the ingredients that you should um, try to pour into your life in order to find lasting fulfillment. And then finally, when we spend, we should spend with God's honor in mind. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. Whatever we do in word or deed, we should, we should do to glorify God. And as we're buying, we need to be thinking about what we're buying, uh, thinking about uh, what we're supporting. And you know, generally, when it comes to spending, Maybe a, an all-encompassing statement would be just to stop and think uh, before we spend. And then we want to have something to save. And, and th these aren't in order. Obviously, you would, you would want to, if, you were, if you're working and you're earning, you would want to save and invest before you spend. But there, it's all part, of the, uh, all part of the ultimate puzzle. So with regard to saving, I, I'm, I'm making a distinction between saving and investing. When I say saving, I'm thinking about ultimately like an, an emergency fund, uh, saving things for fixed short-term goals, uh, things that are things that are ultimately highly predictable. Uh, if you have a vehicle, you know that that vehicle is going to break in some way. You know you're going to have to replace. You're going to have to have oil changes. You're going to have to uh, replace tires. Things of this nature. Uh, you know that's coming, and so rather than letting it be uh, a surprise. Uh, go ahead and have be setting aside some money each each week, each month, however you're paid, so that you'll have something available when these highly predictable needs arise.
we see some we see some principles for us in in scriptures. Genesis forty one verses forty seven through forty nine is of course the uh, the account of Joseph and the seven years of famine followed by the seven year or the seven years of abundance followed by the seven years of famine. Joseph knew by uh, the, the grace of God that there was going to be a famine in the land. He knew that. Uh, there was going to be a period of time where there was going to be an abundance. And so during that period of abundance, during his uh, earning season, if you will, he saved up. He set something aside so that when the uh, difficult times came, there would be something available, not just for him, not just for the Egyptians, but he actually was able to help uh, people beyond the borders of Egypt, as we know. And so there's a principle there for us to, to take from that. Uh, we know that there are going to be times where we can earn more, times when we're going to earn less. As a result, we should set something aside and, and be prepared for the down times. And if we don't go to Joseph, we can go to the ant. Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8 tells us to, to go to the ant and see what the ant does. Who We know in, in times of, of harvest, the ant is stowing something away for the winter. You know, the ant could just sit there and eat and eat and eat and enjoy the fact that all of this abundance is available in, in the summertime and not set anything aside and then, you know, have nothing in the winter. Uh, we don't need to be like that. The, the ant is, is called wise. And so we should, we should follow the ant's example and set something aside as well. I think about it this way. Living up, you've heard the phrase, uh, well, that person's living above their means. Uh, that simply means that they're spending more than they make. And so you can think about it this way. Living above one's means leads to debt. You have to borrow to fund that lifestyle. Uh, living at one's means leads to doubt. If you're just living, you know, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, if you're getting by, well, if I get sick, if, I, if, if something happens and I'm not able to earn that next week, then I've got a problem, so I've got a doubt, and I'm wondering if I'm going to make it. But living below one's means leads to distinction, greatness, being a person of consequence. You can think of like of, of Joseph. Uh, during the seven years of abundance, Joseph and, uh, and all of Egypt lived below their means. And so they, uh, he uh, ended up being a person of distinction. And then finally, if we, we, don't, we don't just save, we also invest. And we're just going to move fairly quickly here as uh, time is slipping by. As we, we think, think about our roles, we should work, we should save, we should invest. Some principles from Proverbs, Proverbs 31 verse 16, of course that's the, the virtuous woman who saw opportunities to invest uh, and did so. Matthew chapter 25 uh, speaks specifically to uh, putting, money, putting the money to work, the, the talents that were given to, uh, to the people. Putting the, that money to work, perhaps uh, by, by trading, commodities, or, or what have you. And then in Ecclesiastes 11, verses 1 and 2, we see this principle of diversification. Diversification. It's, it's not a guarantee of success, uh, but it spreads the risk around. It lowers the risk. And so we should assume a reasonable amount of risk uh, when we're investing and develop a variety of income streams if we have that uh, available to us. You know, it's been said that interest never sleeps. If we think about putting money to work, uh, interest never sleeps. Interest never gets sick. Interest never dies. Interest never goes to the hospital or misses a day of work. Uh, interest works on Sundays and holidays. Interest never takes vacation, and interest never visits or travels. Interest is always working, and if we find ourselves in debt, we're, we're on the wrong side of that and we find ourselves uh, being crushed by that fact. But if we're able to invest and we're able to put money in, in the, even in, in the bank, uh, then we're getting some form of interest and that, that money is working, uh, is working for us. So we should work, save, and invest. And save or invest, well, we should do both. Uh, and I like to, to say that we save for uh, short-term goals and we invest uh, so that we can stay ahead of inflation. Now, we're seeing quite a bit of inflation in the United States right now, 
but it's nothing compared to what happened in Zimbabwe back in 2007. If you can see on the screen, uh, that's a $500 million note. A uh, $500 million note. Uh, 2007 hyperinflation. They ended up printing some of those notes as high as $100 billion. A $100 billion uh, Zimbabwe dollar, if you will. At the time, uh, a loaf of bread cost $35 million. Just, just in Zimbabwe dollars. Um, and, and this is all at various times uh, because hyperinflation just kicked in and, they, and, it, and, it, and it just exploded. But at one point, uh, that $500 million Zimbabwean dollar uh, or note was worth 25 cents US. 25 cents. So inflation is, a, is an issue. Inflation will destroy uh, savings. And so we need to invest uh, at the very least to outpace inflation. Maybe one more here to get you thinking as we, uh, as we start to wrap up. The power of time with regard to investment. I want, I want, uh, I want to inspire young people uh, to invest. There are, there are two people being considered here. Uh, one person is 25 years old, another person is uh, 45 years old. And in this example, we're investing $300 per week or an annual contribution of $15,000. Over, um, over 10 years, the 25-year-old uh, invested that $15,000 a year. Uh, the 45-year-old did it over a 20-year period. The accumulated value uh, over 10 years for the 25-year-old was $225,000, whereas the 45-year-old who invested for a longer period of time uh, accumulated $713,000. This is, this is assuming, by the way, an 8% return, an average return of 8% uh, on these dollars invested. The 25-year-old stopped investing at age 35 and just let, let the money in the account, earning on average that 8% return. And at age 65, had $2.2 million in that investment portfolio. Whereas the 45-year-old started later but kept investing, uh, had that $713,000 accumulation. Simply, simply stated, that's the power of time. Uh, the earlier you start, uh, the better. And, uh, and I think that's important for us to keep in mind. So as we're, as we're thinking about these things, as we're encouraging younger people, um, let's, let's remind them of the power of time. Time is uh, extremely important and extremely effective with regard to our investments. I'm afraid our our time is up here, so we're going to have to just skip forward a bit, uh, all the way to the end. Ultimately, we want, we want to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. And in the, in the, where we pull that quote, well done, good and faithful servant, it's from the parable of the talents. Uh, it's specific to uh, the exercising of good stewardship with regard to our finances. We want to hear that. We want to hear that, and we know that all of life is, is a stewardship. So obviously this is important in all areas of life, but, but with regard specifically for our series, with regard specifically to uh, our finances, uh, we need to understand that God cares how we earn, God cares how we spend, God cares how we save, God cares how we invest. He knows that it's important to us, and as a result, it's important to Him. And so he's, he's given us all of these guidelines, all of these principles, all of these precepts, all of these ways that we can make application from his word uh, to live a life that is pleasing uh, to ourselves, helpful to others, and gives him the glory. And I pray that that is, is what, we, what we learn to do as we consider these thoughts. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we're so thankful that you've given us so much instruction on how to live our lives, and we pray that we will make application of that. Pray that our faith will grow as we saturate our minds with, with your word and think about all that you have uh, left for us to do and all, of the, all that you have uh, enabled us to do to better ourselves, to grow our minds, to prosper, to help our families and to help others, those who are less fortunate, those who are in need, uh, both physically and in need of the gospel. We pray that we will apply ourselves and we will be good stewards and we will um, join hands with you 
as co-creators on this earth, and we will be a blessing to one another, and we'll glorify you in all that we do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.